and welcome back to Jesus Christ Prison Ministry. Our topic today, the law. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10, 4. Wow! The Christian churches today grab onto that text and will teach you, one, Jesus is the end of the law and did away with the Ten Commandments. Two, you just have to believe and you will be saved. Those two concepts are taught in some form or another by every denomination or church upon the face of the earth. However, they are teaching you the biggest lie ever to come from the mouth of the devil. But you say, that verse is in the Bible. It must be true. Peter understood your confusion. He was running into the same problems in his day. People were taking Paul and other scriptures, which, of course, scriptures to Peter and Paul were Old Testament, and twisting them and taking them out of context in order to fit their own interpretations. Listen now to what Peter says of Paul's writings. Some things in them are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, leading to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. That's 2 Peter 3.16. Are you getting the point? Are you opening your mind? It is important to set aside our own feelings our own beliefs, our own interpretations, our own opinions, and of course, the church influences from which we are guided. We must dig deep. We must do our own study, our own work. We must study and read the whole Bible and put all the pieces together in order to understand the total plan of salvation. We must lay down some basic and biblical criteria before we do any study. If someone came up to you and said, all those people in that room are gay, what would you think? What emotions would you be feeling? What image would be going through your mind? You turn to leave and find a friend about to enter that room. You stop your friend and say, don't go in there. They are all homosexual. But your friend looks at you funny and says, no, they aren't. No one in there is homosexual. Would you be confused? See the problem? It is a word problem. It is simply one of understanding terms, and times. At one point in time, gay meant, and I quote from Wikipedia, feelings of being carefree, happy, or bright and showy. However, in modern thought, it is understood to refer to a homosexual person. That same problem exists in our biblical thinking. We, in the 21st century, are applying definitions to words that had completely different definitions at the time they were used in the Bible. As Peter said, it is ignorant and unstable people who refuse to listen to the truth. They are not doing the research to understand what the original writer meant at the time of his writings. I pray that you do not want to be ignorant or unstable, that you will come with me on a journey and learn truth that is no longer being taught by our modern churches, denominations, or pastors. Why? Because they have twisted and distorted scriptures. So let's start with some simple concepts that are plainly taught in the Bible. God does not change his plan of salvation, or his character. In 1 Samuel 15, 29, we read, 
Moreover, the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he's not a man that he should change his mind. In Psalms 89.34 we read, I will not dishonor my covenant because I will not change what I have spoken. In Malachi 3.6 we read, I the Lord don't change. In Romans 11.29 we read, For God's gifts and calling never change. In Hebrews 13.8 we read, Jesus the Messiah is the same yesterday and today and forever. Praise God for that. Once we understand that concept, everything else is simple. Simple, that is, if we are willing to change our minds and lives to come into harmony with God's. But that is the problem. We want God to change so we don't have to and can continue in our sins. But this is what God says about that. In 2 Kings 13.6 we read, Nevertheless, they did not change course away from the sins of Jeroboam's household, by which he caused Israel to sin, but continued on that same course. In Job 6.29 we read, Repent, let there be no injustice, change your ways, my vindication is at stake. In Jeremiah 3, I'm sorry, in Jeremiah 7, 3 and 5, we read, This is what the Lord of the heavenly armies, the God of Israel, says, Change your ways and your deeds, and I'll let you live in this place. Truly, change your ways and your deeds. In Jeremiah 15, 7, we read, I'll destroy my people, for they don't change their ways. In Matthew 8, 3, we read, Then he said, I tell you with certainty, unless you change and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 21, 32, we read, John came to you living a righteous life. You didn't believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. But even when you saw that, you didn't change your minds at last and believe him. Unlike the churches and pastors and denominations of today, I will not take a single text and try to build a theology around it. That would be like an ignorant and unstable person. I will take the total weight of scriptures and do what Paul and Jesus and all the prophets of the Bible have commanded us to do. Study. Search. Read every word and make sure that nothing we believe to be true negates or diminishes any other text of our salvation. God can't do that. That is of the devil. With that in mind, we will now go through the Bible and understand the law of God as God wants us to understand it. And in the process, we will get a clearer understanding of who God is. Before we jump into the ancient word of God to discover what God wants us to know about his law, I am going to give to you another illustration of how we can be confused by words and concepts. A friend comes running up to you and is all out of breath as he blurts out, The bank has collapsed and fallen down. Oh, you immediately ask, is the money safe? Should we go and protect our money? Your friend looks at you with a funny look and then says, No, the bank has collapsed and fallen down, and a car has fallen into the river. Ah, now you understand what bank he's talking about. Same word, but without the qualifying noun, you misunderstood what bank he was talking about. Same in our biblical studies. We must make sure we are looking at the proper nouns around the subject 
to make sure we are not misunderstanding. So let us begin our study and see how confused and misunderstood our pastors, churches, and denominations are in their misuse of Scripture. Paul was a Jew. Of course. So were Peter, James, and John. And according to the world of the Pharisees, Peter, James, and John were uneducated, ignorant, and needed to learn from them how to interpret the scriptures. But of course, it was the uneducated that Jesus chose. They were more willing to humble themselves to learn outside the box the Pharisees and the church had constructed around themselves. On the other hand, Paul was educated, upper class, wealthy, and just what the Pharisees believed was a true man of God, unlike those scumbags down at the lake. When Paul talked, he talked to people who were educated, people who knew the law, Romans 7, 1. Paul was talking to people who knew the difference between a bank filled with money from a river bank or a bank shot on a basketball court. All it took was a key word to shift the concept of his hearers into the proper understanding of what law he was talking about. The Jews knew that there were four distinct and separate laws that they had to know and understand. Same today in our complicated and civilized societies. There are traffic laws, health laws, civil laws, building codes, employment laws, and criminal laws. They all fall under the basic concept of law, but they are very different and need to be understood in their differences. In the Old Testament, a Jew would have understood the same. The first and foremost law was the Ten Commandments, otherwise known as the Moral Law. This law was the only law that was proclaimed by the mouth of God to the whole nation of Israel and written by the finger of God. All other laws were simply an extension of this law. In other words, all the other laws showed how to implement the moral law in a practical manner so that each person could understand his duty to his family, neighbors, and community in which he lived. Therefore, the second law was the civil laws. If a person broke the moral law and stole a sheep, what was to be done? Well, the civil laws spelled out the punishment and what was to be done. Four sheep were to be paid back for one stolen sheep. What happens if a man digs a hole and his neighbor falls in? Well, the moral law that was broken was, Thou shalt not steal. The neighbor fell in and was deprived of and or had his health and livelihood stolen from him. Therefore, the law required that the man who dug the hole was to pay for the wages the man lost while recuperating and made sure that all his medical bills were paid. The civil law simply demanded accountability from every member of society. Each person was to memorize the moral law and put them into action in everyday life. You will find the majority of civil laws defined in Exodus chapters 21 through 23. What happens when a person gets sick? You need health laws. Just as we have health laws today that are strictly enforced, so they were back then. A virus or contagious disease could easily wipe out a community. Therefore, God laid down health laws to isolate or quarantine those who had communicable diseases. These, along with our other health rules were to keep his people healthy. Even today, if a house has mold in it, that mold must be cut out and destroyed or it will bring sickness and possibly death to the inmates of the home. In the Old Testament, God gave actions that had to be applied to mold and other contagious medical conditions in order to keep the people and the community healthy. You will find the majority of these health laws spelled out in Leviticus chapters 11 through 15. The laws that God laid down at Mount Sinai for the Israelite communities are so awesome and particular that every civilized society uses them today 
in some principal form or another. None have been done away with in principle. Then, of course, there was the temple law. The Bible is very plain in the understanding that living for this world is of no value. The only life that is worth living is the life that lives for the world to come. From Adam to John the Revelator on the island of Patmos, all God's children count themselves as strangers and pilgrims here on this earth. Nothing of this earth is important to them except as it relates to their eternal life and the world to come. We look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11.10 All God's children have died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. Oh, folks, my dear friends, are we ashamed down here to call God our God by the way we live? Since we are seeking a heavenly home and not this earthly home, there must be a way of reaching that home. The problem is, the moral law of God requires the death of every single person who breaks it. That presents a dilemma. How do sinful human beings become at one with a righteous God? That is where the temple laws came in. The sacrificial system set up by God at the gate of the Garden of Eden, when our first parents sinned against God, represented the plan of salvation. That sacrificial system was used by all God's children in faith, looking forward to the one who was to come as the Lamb of God to give his life for our sins. That sacrificial system pointed to the one who would pay the penalty that we deserved, death. That sacrificial system was a shadow and symbol of the sacrifice that the coming Messiah would make in behalf of the world. For almost 2,500 years, that sacrificial system was used by faith by all of God's children to direct their minds to the coming Messiah. By the time of Moses, the world had almost forgotten the plan of salvation. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt and for over a hundred years had not been able to view and experience that sacrificial system that directed their minds to the great sacrifice of God on their behalf. Therefore, God had to bring his people out of bondage and into the desert in order to present his plan of salvation in a most beautiful temple service. In every particular, the temple and the temple service that God gave Moses was to represent the true temple in heaven and the plan of God's salvation for man. Moses' temple was a copy of the temple in heaven. We read in Hebrews 8.5, They serve in a sanctuary that is a copy, a shadow of the heavenly one. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tent, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. This foreshadowing, this copy of the heavenly sanctuary, this representation of the plan of salvation was the true first covenant. As Hebrews 9.1 states, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. Here you see a representation of the temple. It was divided into three compartments. The first compartment was the outer court. Here the contrite sinner brought his lamb to represent the Lamb of God who would take the sinner's place of death. Keep in mind, the lamb had to be perfect without blemish in order to represent the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Also keep in mind, the outer court represents, you might say, us when we were estranged from God. We were outside of him. 
It is the sacrificial process that allowed them by faith to come into the presence of God or into the presence of the temple. The contrite sinner confessed his sins over the lamb and then slit the throat of the lamb. This slitting of the throat represented the fact that our sins killed the Lamb of God. It was because of our sins that the Messiah, the Lamb of God, had to die. We killed him. The blood of the Lamb was then transferred to the holy compartment of the temple by one of the priests. That transference represents and foreshadowed the transference of our sins from us to the books of heaven. Remember, the Bible is very plain in Revelations 20.12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Hebrews 9.21 Inside this holy compartment were vessels that represented the work of God for the salvation of man. They were foreshadows and copies of the reality that was to come in Jesus Christ. For a tent was set up, and in the first part were the lampstand, the table, and the bread of the presence. This was called the holy place, Hebrews 9, 2. The lampstand represented the light that would come into the world to teach us the way and the truth to that one and only life. The bread of the presence represented the word of God that we are to eat and digest into our lives. We are to take the Ten Commandments and eat them, memorizing them and putting them into our hearts that we might not sin against God. That's Psalms 119.11. And last of the furniture in the holy place was the altar of incense. This altar was sometimes moved into the most holy place for certain events. It represented the prayers of Jesus as our great high priest for the salvation of man. The incense that was burned on this altar and the smoke rising up from the altar represented, foreshadowed, the prayers and petitions of Jesus on man's behalf. The last compartment is known as the most holy place. This contained the most important article in all the temple. It is the only article that is not a shadow. It is the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. We find in Revelation 15:5 where the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. That testimony is the Ten Commandments. It testifies to the character of God. It has always been and always will be the foundation of God's government. It is the whole reason for the temple plan. If there had been no sin, there would have been no need for a temple plan of salvation. If no one had ever broken the moral law, there would be no need for a sacrifice. The temple services did not save one person. The reason for the temple services was to point us to the plan of salvation that was to bring man back into at oneness, atonement. With the Ten Commandments, we had broken. That plan of salvation was embodied in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 8.13 we read, In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. So what was soon to disappear? The need for symbols, foreshadows, and copies, which educated or taught us, and were like teachers to teach us the plan of salvation. All were to disappear because now the main point is, what we are saying is this, we do have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tent set up by the Lord and not by any human. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. What Hebrews is saying here 
is that if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. But God found something wrong with his people when he said, Look, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hebrews 8, 7 and 8. Notice, he didn't find anything wrong with the law, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. He found something wrong with the people and what was wrong with them. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors at the time when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt because they did not remain loyal to my covenant. I ignored them, declares the Lord. Hebrews 8, 9. See that? They did not remain loyal to his Ten Commandment covenant. In other words, they did not keep the Ten Commandments in their hearts. They had not memorized them and learned how to obey them. Therefore, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Hebrews 8.10 Was this something new? Of course not. Remember, God does not change. We read in Deuteronomy 4.29, Seek the Lord your God, then you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and soul. That's Old Testament. No different from the New Testament. In Deuteronomy 6.5, You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Deuteronomy 6.6 6, Let these words that I'm commanding you today be always on your heart. Well, you would think it was coming straight out of the New Testament. Well, of course. Jesus taught from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 10.12 Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God desire from you? Only this. Fear him, walk in all his ways, love him, serve him with all your heart and in all your life. As you can see, God does not change. There is no difference in Old and New Testaments in the plan of salvation. God requires His law, His Ten Commandments, to be written on the heart in both the First and Second Covenants, in both the Old and New Testaments. Nothing has changed for salvation. What did change, as you can see by this illustration, is that the temple services that pointed to the death of the Lamb of God were no longer needed. The lampstand, which pointed to the light of the world, was no longer needed. The showbread was no longer needed. Why? Because Jesus Christ came and He is the living Lamb of God. He is the living light of the world. He is the living bread that came down from heaven that if we eat and put into our hearts and minds and souls, huh, well, we will have eternal life. The problem in the Old Testament was simple. The people refused to obey God and His Ten Commandments, and He destroyed them. He will do the same to His people in the New Testament if they refuse to learn from the example of those in the Old Testament and continue to break His Ten Commandments. God does not change. Paul tells us this when he tells us now their experiences serve as examples for us so that we won't set our hearts on evil as they did. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 One of the major changes or differences between the first and second covenants is the temple and priesthood. The first covenant had an earthly temple and earthly priest. The second covenant has a heavenly temple and Jesus as our high priest. Jesus became our high priest and now ministers in the new covenant temple in heaven. His priesthood is an eternal priesthood. He does not have to be replaced as the earthly shadow priest did. He has no need to offer sacrifices every day like high priests do, first for his own sins and then for those of his people. Since he did this once for all when he sacrificed himself. Hebrews 7, 27. Now we understand the mentality of the Jews of Paul's day. They understood the law as Paul understood it. Therefore, when Paul talked about the law being done away with, 
they understood immediately that he was not talking about the moral law, the Ten Commandments. He was talking about the shadows and copies of the temple services that pointed to the reality of the Messiah. There was no need to offer lambs when the Lamb of God was already sacrificed. There was no need to go through the temple rituals of sacrifices, hand washings, and circumcision when the true sacrifice had been washed and circumcised for us. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.19, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but obeying God's commandments is everything. Here we find the absolute division in Paul's mind between the temple services and the moral law. Everything in connection with the temple services was nothing to Paul. The only thing that counted was obedience to the Ten Commandments, which are eternal. And so we now come back to Jesus, who said in Matthew 5:17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The wicked churches, pastors, and denominations of the world today only quote you the last part of the text. See, they say, Jesus fulfilled them, and they are done away with. Again, they are so ignorant and unstable that they truly make liars of Jesus and God. How? Because Jesus just said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. Since he came not to abolish them, they are not done away with and are still necessary for your salvation. When Jesus stated on the cross, it is finished. He was referring to the plan of salvation, the temple services that pointed to his sacrifice, not the plan of redemption. The temple services and sacrifices and rituals pointed to a Messiah who would come to pay the penalty for sin. He did. They were no longer needed. But the Jewish rulers and leaders refused to accept that fact. They had rejected the Messiah and continued in their useless temple services. Therefore, in A.D. 70, Jesus sent Titus to destroy the temple and wipe it off the face of the earth. This was done in order for the world to know and understand that the shadows, copies, examples, systems, and rituals of the temple, which led people to the Messiah, were finished. But the plan of redemption was still proceeding as planned. Type had met anti-type. Shadow had met substance. And the moral law stood up clear and undefeated. The cross revealed the fact that God hates sin so much. The sinner must die unless he turns from his wicked ways and looks to the blood of Jesus to pay the penalty for past sins. However, the wages of sin is death, and sin is the transgression of the law 1 John 3, 4. Therefore, the law, the Ten Commandments, are still in force and must be obeyed. After all, as Paul says, without law, there is no sin. Therefore, Jesus did not have to die. All he had to do was abolish the law. But as you have already learned, Jesus came and stated that he came not to abolish the law. After all, they were spoken by Jesus, the Word, and written by his own finger on Mount Sinai. Therefore, we see the harmony in his words when he stated in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Why are they his? Because he wrote them. He commanded them to Moses. He wrote them with his own finger. And if you want to get into that life, you must keep the commandments Matthew 19:17 nothing has changed Paul says the same thing Romans 2:13 for it is not merely those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight no it is those who follow the law who will be justified Romans 2:18 and know his will and approve of what is best because you have been instructed in the law Romans 2.23, as you boast about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Romans 3.31, do we then abolish the law by this faith? Of course not. Instead, 
we uphold the law. Romans 7, 12. So then, the law itself is holy, and the rule is holy, just and good. In Revelation, we are plainly told that no liars will be in heaven. The way the modern churches interpret Paul make Paul, Jesus, and the Bible a liar. Therefore, nothing they teach will get you into heaven. According to them, the whole Bible is a lie and cannot be trusted and is to be rejected. But Jesus is very plain. He taught that we are to obey the teachings of the Old Testament that have to do with our salvation. Jesus kept the Ten Commandments perfectly and commands us to follow his example. Jesus left this earth with this statement ringing in the ears of the disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And what did Jesus command us while on earth? In Matthew 5, 48, he commanded us to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. In John 5, 14, he commanded us to sin no more. And in Matthew 19, 17, he commanded us, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. As Jesus fulfilled the law in his life, so must we fulfill the law in our lives. No, my friend, the moral law is not done away with. The Ten Commandments shine forth brighter than they ever did on Mount Sinai. In and through the life of Jesus, they shine out and reveal the love of the Ten Commandments. Every loving deed is a fulfillment of one of the commands of the Ten Commandments. They are perfect, they are righteous, they are holy. Only as we keep them will we be perfect, righteous, and holy. Only those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus will be in heaven. Revelation 14, 12. And what was that faith Jesus had? He had such faith that he would rather die than break one of the commandments. So it must be with you if you want to be in heaven. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 7, 8, and 9. Did you hear that? Salvation is only offered to all who obey him. Not your church, not your pastor, not your denomination. And he commands us to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly without sin, as he did. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who loves us so much, he is willing to take the penalty of your sins. But if you willingly continue in your sins and reject the sacrifice he has made for you, then you have no salvation. Hebrews 10, 26. Let us accept his sacrifice in our lives and die daily to our sins and turn away from them and live as Jesus lived through the power he offers us to live the obedient, righteous, and holy life of the Ten Commandments. Paul, who would never argue or disagree with Jesus, said, what should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Of course not. How can we who died, as far as sin is concerned, go on living in it? Romans 6, 1 and 2. How true that is. A dead person cannot go on sinning. We are to die daily to sin and our human feelings, passions, and wants. We are to live daily, growing into the perfection of Jesus Christ and His perfect law of love, the Ten Commandments. To recap our understanding of the term law, it goes something like this. 1. The first law is the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, and can never be done away with since sin is the breaking of them. Without sin, we would not need a Savior. 2. The temple laws were the instructors, the teachers, to instruct us about the Savior and the plan of salvation, to show through foreshadows, types, systems, and ceremonies how the plan of salvation was to be implemented. These were done away with when the type meant anti-type, when the Lamb of the sinner met the Lamb of God. 3. The civil laws, 
simply expressed how the moral law was to be lived in our daily lives, providing punishment and justice in a civilized community. Punishment and justice can never be done away with since they are the foundation of all governments and laws. Four, and the fourth law was the health laws. The principles laid out in these laws are still in use today. Without health laws, our lives would be short, unhealthy, and miserable. So the principles laid out by God in the health laws could not be done away with either. God knows what is best for man, whom he created in his own image. God bless you as you cease to be ignorant and unstable in your knowledge of the Bible and strive daily to meet the fulfillment of the law of God in your life as Jesus did. Thank you.